All right, here we go. We're going to jump into The Secret Stories, a phonics and phonemic awareness um, strategy. I'm really excited about this particular strategy. I think it I think it fits in really well. It sort of checks for me. It checks all those boxes that we looked at all of those those different series with through that critical lens. And so we're going I'm going to jump fairly deep into this one so that you have a really good sense of of what it is about. The rest of these uh, slides are from other presentations that I have been at with Katie Garner, uh, keynote speakers, or when she was doing keynote speakers at um, the ILA presentation, uh, ILA conference, um, International Literacy Association conference, if you uh, want to know what ILA is, uh, as well as just, I've just been sort of snooping through all of her, uh, all of her resources. And so the rest of this, of this lecture are, are resources that I've pulled from her from her work so she is you can find any more of her, of her specifically her stuff or her resources at her website she's on Twitter she's on Instagram and if you're interested in her scientific synopsis research synopsis um, it's quite interesting it's fairly readable it's a little long but if you're interested it's uh, it's I think it's it's it makes sense it makes sense and it's connected to the neuro and the cognitive science that is out there around how the brain works, particularly when reading, when decoding, when using sight words, when um, when bringing reading all together. Okay, so to start us off, we're going to do this little this little activity on the side. So I want you to uh, get a piece of paper, get an actual piece of paper, and draw a really rough sketch of a brain. Don't overthink it; just rough, a really rough sketch of a brain on about two thirds to three quarters of the paper. You're gonna have to write some things on the outside. So just get the brain, sketch it, and then and then what you're going to do, you can stop the video at any time if you need to do it. Then number one, I want you to, ah, I'm gonna use my little pencil here because that's fun. How about we change colors just for, how about, I don't know, blue? Okay, let's do blue. So number one, I want you to pick 10 random letters and write them down inside your brain. So just 10 random letters, write them inside your brain. Then, you can stop the video whenever you want. Then I want you to pick five high frequency sight words and write them inside the brain next to the letters. If you don't know what those sight words are, go back to your reading for this week and have a look at those sight words. So just pick five of those. And then don't worry that there's no three. I know for you, for you people who like one, two, three, there's just no three. I want you then to draw a picture of your favorite animal outside the brain anywhere on the page. So if you want to draw whatever is your favorite animal, just do a quick little drawing, a little sketch of your animal. Okay, if you haven't done all that, stop the video before you go on to the next, the next slide. Oh, I guess I have to get rid of my pencil before I can advance my slides, look at that. Okay, now what I want you to do is I want you to, using only the 10 letters and the five sight words in your brain, I want you to write what your animal is and why you like it so much. So only using the 10 letters and the five sight words in your brain, write what your animal is and why you like it so much. Go ahead, do it. Okay, you're probably getting the idea that Probably lots of you are like this lady here, right? It's like, well, I can't, I can't, I don't have enough. I don't have enough, I don't have enough knowledge. I don't have enough letters. I don't have enough sounds to actually write what I, what I have in my head that I know I wanna write, but I actually can't write. So Katie Garner's idea is that it's really difficult to do this without having the letters or the code. Basically, then we are asking like our K students, our grade one students, our grade two students to write things like this, but we're actually not really giving them the tools. So kids will end up, they'll just start writing down any letter because they're just kind of mimicking. They're like, well, I should be doing something. And then it, the confusion starts. Basically, her ideology is that kids need to have all the letters and the code 
or else they cannot experience reading and writing. They can only watch the show. They can only watch the teacher do it. They can only watch their classmates who seem to get it do it. Um, and it starts with knowing the code. They need to know the letters in order um, to start, not in order, sorry, I paused at the wrong time. They need to know the letters in order to start down the path to reading. And then they need to know how the letters are combined because that is what reading and writing is. So if we just teach the letters individually and the sounds individually without ultimately combining them, they, they're kind of like you with this exercise. They, they're willing and eager, but they're not armed with the skills. And her premise is that all of this needs to happen quickly, not over years. Her mantra is two weeks to two months, all the sounds of the alphabet and all of the phonemes. Two weeks to two months. Super, super interesting. Okay, so let's have a look at how she, or why, why she believes that this is a good system for her. Basically, her pedagogy is based on neuroscience in basically what is happening in the brains of four, five, and possibly six-year-olds. So basically, she's saying, sorry, I'm going my little pencil here. Is she saying that according to child development, this is where our four, five, and six-year-olds are? They are developing from the, they develop, the, the brain develops from the back to the front and they are in the center of social emotional learning right now. Up here is the frontal lobe. Who remember this from Ed Psych? This is a frontal lobe that develops last. They are nowhere near that. And, but what she is saying is that reading is a really abstract, high level um, learning. Like we need to be in the, we need to be engaging a part of the brain that is actually not developed yet. When we use particular systems where we need kids to connect abstract ideas. And I'm going to get into that a little bit, okay? So our kids are concrete learners. They're just, um, she alludes to, they're just a step away from actually figuring out the world by eating it. Remember two and three year olds are still like shoving stuff in their mouths to try to figure out what it is. Those are, are four, five and six year olds are pretty close to that still. So to be saying, look at this picture, this is a bee, buh, buh, buh. And they're like, what? Can I eat it? Um, so she's saying we need to be, we need to be teaching through concrete learning instead of abstract learning. Here's a bee, buh, buh, buh. Kind of thing. Okay, so um, we have to meet them where they're at developmentally or else they, they're they not going to figure this out and especially those at-risk learners. Okay, so she talks about this, I, I quite like this, this sort of elephant in the room. So there are lots of elephants in the room when we talk about alphabet sounds because it doesn't make sense the way that we teach the alphabet. So if we say A is for anteater, first of all, how many kids in medicine had have ever seen an anteater? So they're like, we don't know what an anteater is. We don't know that anteater starts with A. And we don't even know that the sound eh, eh, actually is that, that thing that you keep, that you keep pointing to when you say anteater, ah. So you can see there's a lot of really, really abstract concepts when you are saying this. Um, in, I think there's a, yeah. Do you remember last year when I showed you the video of the girl, the little girl who was doing flashcards and she came upon a narwhal? I don't even know how to spell narwhal, right? And so we're asking where, you know, we say N for narwhal and the kids are again like, first of all, what's a narwhal? What are you talking about? That's a weird word. And it, it's too much of an abstract connection to go mm, narwhal to that, again, that N thing that's on, that's on the board. Okay. So also uh, the, when we, we have to make sure in our classroom that they can actually see all of the letters. Um, she pointed out that, you know, where's, where's the rest of the alphabet here. So when, the teacher is talking about the G sound. 
there's not even G there. There's not even a G for, for the kids to go, okay, what is, what is she talking about kind of thing? And then here is the actual physical little elephant um, in the room. Also, her premise is that when we teach letters in this way, so like T is for turtle, they suddenly then see the, and, but you don't go t, h, uh, you go th, the, the, the th, so they're going, well, you just said that the t makes a t sound, but now that's not what the sound that it makes. So it lessens your credibility if they always see sounds and symbols that do not correspond to what you're saying. So if you always say t for turtle, what happens when they see the? So again, it makes, makes a little bit of, of sense, whoa, go away, uh, in here. Okay, again, some of the things are contradictory in the, if we use sort of a traditional uh, A is for apple and it says ah, 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 so here. And then O is for octopus and it says oh, it says ah, 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 octopus. And then the child goes, yeah, but what's happening when we do calendar and the A is making the O sound, ah, August. It's not making the ah, ah, apple sound. Okay, and why is there an A in that word? I thought that O was supposed to say ah. So there's all these contradictions that when we teach the alphabet sounds sort of in a probably a traditional way that you would have been taught, that there's so many contradictions that the kids actually maybe stop believing you. Or all you have to, if the kid asks, well, why, like this child here, why? is A making O sound, you just have to say, well, it just does. You just have to remember and don't think, just memorize. Okay, so we have to give them the phonic skills in the moment that they need them. So when you're doing calendar time and there's an, there's an A that's not acting the way that an A is normally is, the way that you taught it, you got to go after it right there. Okay, so uh, this is you. This is a little bit like the, the example of the chaos poem that you that we looked at last year. So if you want just a little bit of a break, this is an "I Love Lucy" from 1950s. It's um, is a little comedic look at the pronunciation of English and how crazy how crazy it is. So if you want a little a little laugh, a little three minute laugh, have a go with this. If you feel like you've got the idea that how that that there's so many crazy things in English, then keep on going. Okay, what I want to do here is, this is, what I have linked here is the actual, it's called, she calls it, this is Katie Gardner's Better Alphabet Song. And so she goes through all the possibilities of all the sounds that the letters can make anytime. So you, so you'll, I want you to actually go to this site and go to 12 minutes. If you don't want to watch all of it, just go to 12 minutes. And I want you to actually sing along with her. It's COVID time, you're by yourself. You can actually sing by yourself and that's cool. I want you to actually sing through. So you might want to watch it a couple times and get the idea of all the different sounds that this Better Alphabet song actually introduced to the children so that when they come to those exceptions they actually they actually know that there's a that that c can be k, k or s sound or an a can make an ah like a ah apple ah sound or it can say its name a okay so again I would go through it if you have if you have time. I would go through it a couple times, listen to it once, and then actually sing along, so that you're starting to again get those particular those particular sounds. Be ready. I was trying to figure out how I could have you sing this during our collaborate time, but audio will be a, a disaster. I want you to be able to answer the, some of the pros and cons that you think there are around a an alphabet song like this. Okay, so again, stop the video, go there, have a little bit of a go with this particular alphabet song. Okay, I'm gonna keep going here with sight words. So I put the sight word chart on this reading, on this week's reading list, because it's pretty, it's a pretty common thing that we ask kids to memorize sight words. And we do flashcards and we say, you gotta have these many sight words by the end of pre-K, K, grade one, grade two kind of thing. Uh, what Katie Gardner's saying is that we 
need to that when kids are tr are trying to figure out words just by sight just by straight up memorization their brain is not actually engaged but when they are using these different codes like the better alphabet and all of the secrets that i'm going to introduce you to their brain is actually on fire because they're actually really they're decoding it and they're thinking they're really thinking about it so instead of memorizing 300 sight words a child can actually figure out her with um these codes that we're going to jump into in a minute okay so the prize for memorizing a sight word is one word and the prize for knowing a secret is a hundred hundreds of words because it opens it opens it up okay Oh, I want to go back to that one. It's the the old adage: uh, you give a person a fish, you feed them, you feed him or her for a day. You give, um, you teach them how to fish, and you feed them for a lifetime. It's the same kind of thing. If you get them to learn one sight word, they have one sight word. If you teach them how to decode, you open up their world of reading to them. Okay. So her basis of her whole kind of program is the idea that secrets are the key. So when letters are making the sounds that they're supposed to, so like t in turtle, the whole world is harmonious. But it does not often happen, does not often happen like this. And what she has, she has come up with are all of these secrets um, to teach the kids phonics. And secrets, when you got, when you have somebody going, hey, I have a secret to tell you, are you not instantly kind of intrigued and you kind of want to know? Again, what she's saying is it's clicking into that social emotional uh, part of the brain. It's like, yeah, I want to know what this secret is. I want to be part of this. And what she's saying is that's a huge part of, of this particular of this particular program. So again, remember in 321 and 371, we talked about the synapses and the neurons happening. What we want to do is we want to link these secrets to concepts and ideas that the, the students already know. So I'm going to introduce this later on, but something like ER, IR, UR, uh, they make the er, er sound, right? They make the, and so what you can do is you make, you make, oh, it's like driving a car really fast around the corner. Er, er, er. Kids kind of, they, they're like, oh, okay, yeah, that's cool. I've heard that sound before. And they make that sound, and now they suddenly know the sound for ER, UR, IR is ER. And then you connect it to the physical letters up, up there. Okay, so again, the brain likes patterns, and it likes to link ideas to uh, background knowledge. It always makes more sense. So all of these secrets are built on things that kids can really relate to and that they've probably experienced in their life already. Okay. So again, it makes it important learning. It draws the students in. And these secrets she's found, this, this kind of a concept works with pre-KK all the way up to like grade five. You just have to, to do it a little different with a grade five than you would with a pre-K student in your actual delivery of it. But the idea that this is a cool, this is a cool thing and you want to know intrigues them and gets their brain and gets their brain active. Okay, let's jump into why secrets are good. Secrets are good stories. They're just good stories. And we are story people. So this was one of her, uh, one of her teachers who used her system. This was uh, an email that she got. My intention was to use these strategies with students with significant phonemic weaknesses. My small group got way bigger than I planned because the majority of students wanted to join in. Some of my strongest readers were strategically placing themselves around us on the rug while pretending to read a book so they could listen in. Okay. Because it's like, oh, they're telling these secrets. They're, they're telling stories. I need to be on on it. So that's, that's a, a big part of her, of her premise. Okay. I want you to, uh, again, stop the video, click this link and see how excited these kids are. These kids are super excited to be working with words and to be able to actually write down the, the words. So again, I think it's about, uh, I don't know, it's about three or four minutes. Have a little bit of a watch because it's super fun to see these kids 
the teacher is super excited and and she's saying things like your brains are gonna explode and and they just they go wild so again stop the video have a little watch of this and i'm actually going to uh i'm actually going to start a different video for the secret so that you can come back to that separately if you want